Ash, I think we may start now. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My apologies. I'm slightly behind. Um, welcome to this uh, edition on um, this session on the value of vaccines for society and special populations uh, provided by FIP as part of the FIP conference. My name is Ash Oksoni. Ash Soni, I am one of the FIP vice presidents. I'm very uh, pleased to be able to lead this session today. If we can go to the next slide. Um, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. Um, the recording will be available on the FIP website at www.fip.org. Um, you may ask any questions, but please use the question box provided rather than the chat box if you can, because it's much easier for us to be able to monitor the questions that they come through and to be able to make sure that they are answered. Uh, you are welcome to provide feedback to webinars at fip.org. Uh, this will help us to make sure that in future the, the program improves if there's anything that you find that you'd like to see improve. And if you find it very good, then please let us know. And also, please remember to become a member of FIP if you're not at www.fip.org forward slash membership registration. Um, please, can we move on? Thank you. And for this session, I'd like FIP would like to thank GSK for supporting this online event, which has made this available for you and for the bringing our speakers to us. Next slide. In today's program, we have opening remarks from Dr. Catherine Duggan, the FIP CEO, very uh, pleased that she can join us and she can find, has the time for a session like this. Um, and then you'll get an introduction from me. I apologize, you'll hear from me again. And then we have the societal values of vaccines, 20 minutes from Dr. Michael Moore. I'll do his bio when I get to him. And then I have a life course, an inclusive approach to vaccine vaccination strategies from Professor Justin Ortiz. And then there will be two videos and you please use the time during those videos to also ask more questions. And obviously if you come up with questions, please ask them during the sessions that you're listening to. And then we will have a 30 minute session for questions from the audience, which we will answer through whichever channel and wrap up and final remarks will take five minutes. My job mainly is to keep things to time. Learning objectives after this webinar, hopefully you will have a much better understanding of the following topics. The social and economic value of vaccines, the imperative for a life course approach to vaccination, the value of vaccines for special populations, such as adults and older, older adults, maternal, and for non-communicable diseases. Vaccination coverage rates and herd immunity and the benefits. And COVID-19, the need for mass immunization and the role of pharmacists when vaccines become available. Next slide. Now, if I can hand over to um, our illustrious chief executive, uh, Dr. Catherine Duggan. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Ash, for your introduction and for chairing this session today. I'm really looking forward to it. It gives me great pleasure to greet all of our attendees today and offer special greetings to our guest speakers. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Michael Moore from the World Association of Public Health Associations and Dr. Justin Ortiz from the Centre for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland. Together with FIP, Michael's and Justin's organisations are members of the steering committee of the Immunisation for All Ages Coalition, or IFAA. The IFAA is also made up of the International Federation on Ageing, the International Longevity Centre UK, and the Confederation of Meningitis Organisations and the UN Foundation Shot at Life campaign. Finally, the IFAA benefits from collaboration, collegiality and cooperation. And this is enhanced by the immense support from Pfizer, whom we thank for their championship of this essential work. FIP values this partnership very much and how organisations and experts from different sectors of civil society jointly promote equitable access to vaccines and a life course approach to vaccination strategies with a particular focus on expanding vaccination pathways for adults in all countries. This is an imperative for FIP, especially during this year with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
A few months ago, the IFAA issued a manifesto on combating inequity and improving access to immunisation to promote healthy people throughout life, to preserve function and to prevent death and disability. Not only do we value our joint advocacy work, but also our bilateral collaboration on other initiatives like this webinar. This is so important. We cannot do this on our own. We thank you all very much. So colleagues, today's session is the first of three webinars on vaccinology and vaccination strategy that FIP is organising in collaboration with GSK Vaccines between now and January 2021. After these webinars, we will publish a practical toolkit for pharmacists on vaccination, which will be a valuable educational and training resource. This toolkit will include the short videos that you will watch today during the webinar, as well as other training resources and guidance for pharmacists. GSK Vaccines has also supported our recent global survey on the role of pharmacists in improving vaccination coverage, which led to the report we released only a few weeks ago on the 6th of August. The report is available on the FIP website. For all this, I echo Ash's thanks to GSK for your support to our Federation and pharmacists in general. This webinar is also a bridge between the series we have been delivering since July and another special series called Transform Transforming Vaccination Globally and Regionally, which starts next week on the 25th of September, the 10th World Pharmacy Day. I take this opportunity to invite you all to the launch of this series, which will continue until December. What we're doing is seeking to support patients, support practitioners, support organisations and deliver globally and regionally. And now I hand the floor back to Ash to introduce today's webinar topics and our speakers. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for that introduction. It just demonstrates how important vaccination is for pharmacists around the world and actually through pharmacists to the populations that we serve. And I think it's really important that we recognise how much of a role we can play in the future in, in how we look after and support the health and well-being of our populations. For this, for this session, we are talking about the value of vaccines for society and special populations. And for many of us, it's very easy to be able to look at it and consider the real value that vaccines will bring. And in a way, one of the things that COVID-19 has helped us demonstrate is the consequences of a vaccine-free world and how that impacts on society as a whole and impacts on the way society can act and behave and the consequences that we have when we do not have access to vaccines. If we can move to the next slide. However, what we must remember is that there is just as much, there is a huge desire to see more use of vaccines and to see vaccination as a key component of what we do. And for pharmacists to be involved in that vaccination program, we have to remember there is a, a group within society who, for whom vaccination is considered an anathema and something they do not want to, um, uh, want to see happen. The anti-vaxxers program is quite strong and a vo very powerful message that we have to combat as part of what we do. And as from this slide, you can see the, the answer is no. Um, and what the argument that's used is that from vac the vaccine advocates, people like us who believe that there's such an important part of what we need to do, uh, actually see no evidence, hear no evidence and speak no evidence. And our role is to try and combat this, but also to recognize how we use the evidence to be able to make sure that people understand what we are saying and the value that vaccines do bring and to combat, as I say, combat that anti-vaccine um, message because it can be very loud and it can be very easy to, to, to use it or to see it and to believe some of the messages that they give and to see the risks they, they, they encounter. If we can move to the next slide. The other thing to remember around this is that with the anti-vaxxers, alongside them sit a whole cohort of people for whom they have a fear of needles or fear of the, 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 the mechanisms that we use to deliver vaccines. It's very easy, again, from a perspective of a uh, health professional who's used to doing this, who, for whom it's part of their day-to-day -day work, to be able to turn around to an individual and say, well, it'll only tickle, it's a very slight scratch, you won't notice. But for those people, it can be really, really frightening. And again, it's very important for us that we're able to help people to be able to combat that and to make sure we do make it as relaxed and as 
comfortable as possible for them and don't try and force people to feel to to feel that the that the use of a, an injection is just one of those things and not to worry about it it can be quite as i say it can be very frightening and they can find it very easy to align themselves with the anti-vax program because it helps them almost to avoid the risk of being vaccinated and to be negative about it and to see the potential so for, again goes back to this fundamental about how we as a as a, as a group help to um, uh, reduce the the pressure that we get from those that oppose vaccination programs either because they oppose the program itself or because they fear the consequence of the vaccination and from our from our perspective as uh, pharmacists uh, is to ensure that what we are doing is we're providing people with the right messages and to help to uh, myth bust and to help them to understand the value and benefit of vaccines. If we can move to the next slide. So one of the things that we do have is that and again in a way I suspect that whatever uh, however uh, whatever the consequence we've seen from COVID-19 it, within that at the same time is take the opportunity to use this to be able to help people to better understand the benefit and value of the vaccines bring and actually to recognize that we can't get trapped in the trick knowledge that there is of, of or conspiracy um, and thinking that we are immune to this and to recognize how we as pharmacists have a key role not just to deliver the vaccination program but also to support people in understanding why they need to be vaccinated what the what their concerns about it are to be able to address those things to be able to help them to be able to support them in making the decision whether they want vaccination or not to recognize that for some people they will not have it and that we our role is not to force people but actually to be able to help those that genuinely have concerns or are unclear about information they have been given to help them to be able to work out what are the true messages and what are the false messages and where to go to seek the best quality of information so our role, as I say, is not just potentially to deliver vaccine, but also in the public health role to, for people to understand the value of vaccination and the benefit they will get, and not just for them, but their, their, their families, their society. Uh, because again, we can see circumstances where, as health professionals, I've seen it, where health professionals say, well, I don't need the vaccine because I'll be fine, because I'm, I'm one of those groups that are not affected. But as health professionals, we come in contact with those that are most vulnerable in our society. And if we're not vaccinated, we carry the risk of passing on the, the, the disease to the, those that are more vulnerable. So again, it's really important for us to recognize that we should be vaccinated just as much as we expect others to be vaccinated around us. That gives you a, a sort of an understanding from my perspective of why I think we have to recognize the role that we play, not just in the vaccinations, but in the, the messages around vaccinations. So with that, I'd like to hand over to, or move on to our next speaker, because if we can move to the next slide. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Michael Moore. Before I do though, Dr. Michael Moore is the former CEO of Public Health Association of Australia and is a past president of the health of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. So has a really, really powerful background in public health. His Rotary uh, International District, District 9705 governor for 2020-21. Uh, he is the chair of a, of a number of health networks and Michael is a distinguished fellow at the George Institute for Global Health. Uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Canberra and visiting professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, and was formerly a teacher and consultant and served four terms as an elected member of the ACT Legislative Assembly from 1989 to 2001. Michael was Australia's first independent minister when he was appointed as Minister of Health and Com Community Care. In 2017, he was honoured by being made a member of the Order of Australia, and we are very honoured and privileged to have him able to present to us today. Michael, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the introduction and uh, would like to begin uh, my, uh, my slides. So, um, 
we have just, I just have to move down here a little and get control. Oops, it is. The machine is, there we go. Just bear with me one moment while I get this under control. And I think if I just go to there, we might just work in nicely now. There we go. And so uh, what I'm speaking about today is the societal value of the vaccines. And it's uh, worth uh, just going back to one of the comments that Dr. Margaret Chan uh, made when she was the Director General of the, uh, of the World Health Organization. Uh, and she pointed out the challenges facing public health and the broader world context in which we struggle have become too numerous and too complex for a business as usual approach. So when we're talking about vaccine, I think we have to be really careful to make sure we understand it in a global and a societal uh, context. And, uh, and we need to see it as first and foremost, a successful public health measure. And uh, it was the World Health Organization that suggested that it's second only to clean water and sanitation in terms of health. Now that's a big call because there are other issues uh, such as nutrition that plays an incredibly important role. Uh, there are issues uh, of the impact of uh, drugs, particularly when we look at tobacco, alcohol, and all the illicit drugs. So when we look at um, uh, vaccination, we look beyond clean water and sanitation, we need to understand that we are really talking about something that is a really significant contributor to health. So that's sort of the context in which we operate. But let's also see the, the modern current context of COVID-19. Uh, we just turned uh, 30 million cases worldwide today. We're still approaching nearly a million deaths associated with it. And we're still awaiting a safe and efficacious uh, vaccine. And I think this is a really important uh, turning point uh, for us because it really highlights, as Ash said, just how important vaccines are in our, uh, in our society. And that can be highlighted with a couple of other examples. We have actually used vaccines to eliminate smallpox. And so many times I hear anti-vaxxers talking about other things that uh, have an impact, but really, when we look at that example, we uh, can uh, be really clear about what it is and what was the impact on society of people who suffered in this way. And, uh, and I think that it's something that we really need to keep in mind. And look, it was only a couple of weeks ago that the World Health Organization had declared Africa as, uh, as polio free. And the era of the iron lungs is something that uh, we are pleased to leave behind us. And I hope that we'll be pleased to leave behind us the era of the lockdowns associated with the uh, current COVID pandemic. Uh, it is a successful uh, system, but even though we have a successful vaccines and you know, one of the most effective vaccines is measles, let's look at a particular case, uh, a recent outbreak where things can go awry. There were some nurses involved, two nurses who actually eventually went to jail, who uh, were mixing uh, the wrong adjuvant for the uh, measles vaccine. They, they uh, brought about the deaths of a couple of uh, uh, children, and it was really a horrible thing to happen. The spread of vaccine, the fear of vaccines spread. It was fueled by uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and a uh, wife of a very famous footballer in this part of the world um, who uh, were in Samoa and built on that, uh, on that fear. Uh, and the outcome was that a, uh, in 2019, in October, the outbreak was uh, declared and the uh, problem of measles uh, grew in a really uh, significant way. But what can be done about this? Well, uh, governments, the uh, uh, Western Pacific Regional Organization of the World Health Organization, UNICEF, uh, countries like the USA, Australia, New Zealand, uh, pitched in very rapidly to help and to vaccinate the population. And uh, because of their efforts, uh, then we actually managed to turn it around to a point. Uh, but, 
uh, in a population of less than 200,000 people, there were 83 measles-related deaths that were simply unnecessary deaths. And there were people who will suffer over many years through the 5,000, over 5,700 uh, cases. It's particularly close personally for me. My son was there as part of the Australian team and watched babies die. Uh, he's a new father. These sorts of things are really devastating in the broader society, not just for the families who are affected, but for the broader society. And yet measles uh, is so easily controlled through a very, very effective vaccine with minimal uh, side effects. Uh, and you know, when you hear people talk about those side effects, it's worth keeping in mind that invariably the uh, consequences of side effects are nowhere near as bad as the consequences of disease. Another example or another case study has been polio. I mentioned it earlier, but, uh, and uh, in my introduction, it, uh, it, uh, Ash uh, also made it clear that I'm a district governor for Rotary International. And it was our president in, uh, an Australian president actually, in 1978-79, uh, who began the process of getting rid of polio from the world. I mean, what an amazing concept in the first place. And uh, in 1988, there were 350,000 cases. On the 17th of September this year, there were only 104 cases, 37 in Afghanistan and 67 in Pakistan. Now I'm talking a wild uh, of, uh, polio virus. The um, really uh, fascinating uh, part about this is that that's a 30 year international commitment with an investment of around $2 billion. There's about 1.2 million Rotarians in the world. Uh, it was supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, at just the right time, along with Gavi, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, uh, the United States Center for Disease Control. Uh, and that's that sort of coordination, that sort of leadership is what it has a major impact. And when you think about vaccination in terms of society, look at these people who are involved in a leadership way in society in trying to build a better world and how they communicate with people around them and, and uh, with a commitment to caring for others. This is actually the sort of society we really feel that we should have. And so the question for, that I like to ask you as pharmacists or students or people working with pharmacy, so what's the social value of this sort of engagement? And it's the sort of engagement that a pharmacist does in their community day in, day out as part of, the, as part of their work. And, that's, and that leads me into this next slide. Vaccines don't work on their own. Uh, they have to have a whole uh, organization, if you like, around them for the most successful uh, um, immunization. So when I use the word vaccine, I'm talking about actually the delivery of the drug. When I'm talking about immunization, I'm talking about the whole process that's involved. And when you have a universal health scheme, which is advocated, of course, by the World Health Organization, this is so much easier. When you have community support that sells positive messages, that acknowledges some of the challenges, that acknowledges that there are adverse incidents and how you deal with those. These are really important things for a society to consider. And who is really better placed than the pharmacist who's really at the lead of primary health care in most of our communities to be able to deal with these things. But it's not just the pharmacists, it's doctors, it's nurses, it's lab workers, it's supporters, it's journalists. There are so many other people involved. And it's this sort of involvement that, that when we think about the community, the societal value of vaccines, it's about the communities working together to try and get a, a decent outcome. And sometimes people who work in these areas, particularly people who work in very remote areas, as in this uh, slide from Papua New Guinea, uh, these are really very, very significant uh, challenges, but it just shows how much those vaccines are valued by uh, individuals uh, there and in the, uh, and across society. It's about 
caring, committed people. And that, of course, is one of the most significant uh, uh, society uh, values. Uh, and look, while we're looking at uh, vaccine and, uh, and looking at uh, the value in society, I'll, I'll put this slide up for just a moment. I'm really just reflecting on the uh, number of candidates for the COVID-19, uh, actually not COVID, no, the COVAX uh, ones, but COVID-19 um, uh, vaccinations. And this information comes from uh, COVAX. Uh, and uh, I think what we see is that there are a series of different styles of vaccines, but most importantly, what we note is the care to make sure that A, they're efficacious and B, that they're safe. And because if we don't have efficacious and safe um, vaccines, then how do we manage to get a support from our societies? Uh, and when we're getting support from society, is it just from us as individuals or is it about uh, a, a nationalism versus um, a, an international fair and equitable access to, uh, to vaccines? Uh, and we have warnings about this. We have warning from Gavi, from the World Health Organization, from UNICEF about access issues and pointing out that 80 million children in our world at the moment are at risk of disease because of lack of access to vaccines. We also see the nationalism playing a role with the US committing two billion to, uh, on a deal uh, for the BioNTech vac vaccine. And the question there was, does this address society's needs in a most appropriate way, even within the United States? How are they going to be distributed? Will it be distributed equitably? Or will the access go first and foremost to those who can afford it? And it's not just, can you afford it within a country, but between countries? This is a serious challenge for um, the World Health Organization. That's why they're working through COVAX to try and achieve it. Um, but the irony is, if we don't support vaccines in low and middle income countries, if we are unfair about it, then the disease is going to continue spreading and coming back uh, to advanced countries. So there's a, there is even a selfish reason for ensuring that we have a broad and international view on, uh, on vaccines. So the question becomes, well, what are our society values and how do we uh, get there. Um, do we go the greedy route, the route of greed and fear, or do we try and use some compassion? And more importantly, do we make our decisions that are based on evidence? And in the end, that's the uh, real issue for us. And when we're thinking of how to influence governments and make sure they're doing it uh, um, in a compassionate way, we have the Global Charter for the Public's Health which is from the World uh, Federation of Public Health Associations. And their fundamentals are about protection, prevention and health promotion. And they're delivered uh, as a, um, enablers through good governance, through accurate information, through effective advocacy and through capacity building. And so I just leave you with that, uh, with that uh, thought. More information can be found on the uh, website of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Um, and uh, I'd like uh, also to finally uh, say, really, there's a, there's a choice for us. What do we really value? Do we value uh, um, just the vaccines? Do we value our health? Do we value uh, compassion? Uh, what do we value in society and working in society? And isn't vaccine an equitable distribution of vaccines just one element of that. Thanks for the opportunity, Ash. It's been really great to be able to be here and to share my thoughts. Thank you, Michael. I, that, that's fascinating. I think really interesting about that, the, the question you posed at the end in terms of what do we value? And actually, it's, we should value all of that as being part of our public health role in society. Anyway, thank you. Um, and now if I can move on to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Justin uh, Ortiz. For, for who's um, uh, Associate Professor at the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland in the US. Dr. Ortiz is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine. 
his expertise in the clinical epidemiology and prevention of pneumonia. From 2014 to 2017, he was a medical, direct, medical officer at the World Health Organization. So he's very close to some of this immunization department where he led influenza vaccine activities. At WHO, he led programs related to adult immunization and maternal immunization. He was also a member of the WHO editorial board for immunization position papers, helping to develop and update institutional policy for numerous vaccines. He has also worked for the University of Washington and the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He's currently an associate professor, as I say, of medicine at the University of Maryland in the School of Medicine. Uh, again, very privileged to have you, have someone of such esteem speaking to us. Thank you, Justin. Can I hand over to you now? Sure, no, thank you very much. I'm delighted to join you. Um, presumably you can hear me speak. Um, thanks uh, very much to FIP for the opportunity to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart um, and to speak with such um, other um, excellent speakers. So I was asked to discuss a life course and inclusive approach to vaccination strategies. I will describe what is the ideal, but I will also describe um, the status quo. And you'll see that there's a, a, a difference. Now, perhaps the uh, most uh, 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 important global mandate for developing a life course uh, immunization approach comes from the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, in particular, target 3B in the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, requires that uh, countries provide access to medicines and vaccines for all and support research and development of vaccines and medicines for all. Uh, there are other global mandates, however, for the uh, life course approach. The 2011-2020 uh, Global Vaccine Action Plan, for example, which was uh, ratified uh, in 2012 by WHO member states had this strategic objective number three, which is the establishment of a life course approach to immunization planning and implementation, including new strategies to ensure equity across the lifespan. Now, um, of course, uh, WHO loves all of its member states and supports all of its member states. Uh, but uh, it has uh, a particularly important role for low and middle income countries in, in the um, space of immunization. Since 1974, the WHO expanded program on immunization or EPI has prevented millions of deaths. It's one of the most successful public health programs ever. Um, I, I think it's deserving of a Nobel Prize. Uh, and I was very proud to have worked there. Uh, but, um, you know, as I said, WHO's focus is on helping countries that um, have uh, limited resources and, and its policies generally prioritize vaccines that have the greatest impact in resource limited settings. These are vaccines that have a demonstrated uh, efficacy against severe illness that are affordable uh, in low middle income countries and are programmatically suitable for use in low and middle income country settings. Back in 1974, this was the original uh, expanded program on immunization schedule. There was a birth dose of BCG, and then at 6, 10, and 14 weeks, children got oral polio and uh, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, uh, whole cell pertussis vaccines. At nine months, children received a measles vaccine, and during pregnancy, uh, young women received tetanus toxoid. Uh, additional vaccines have been added to the basic EPI schedule over time. Um, you'll see here that hepatitis B vaccine was added um, to the uh, early childhood schedule, as was haemophilus influenza, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, rotavirus vaccine. Uh, the uh, first foray outside of early childhood was a uh, human papillomavirus vaccine, which is typically given to young girls aged uh, 9 to 14 in uh, uh, low and middle income country settings. And then uh, rubella has recently been added to the measles uh, vaccination. 
Now, other vaccines are recommended for certain regions, such as um, yellow fever in Africa, uh, meningococcal conjugate vaccine in the meningitis belt of Africa, and Japanese encephalitis um, in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, um, or high-risk populations um, or certain special circumstances, such as um, uh, in the uh, event of outbreaks. But this is your basic uh, immunization schedule, and, and something that is uh, really quite striking, and, and I want to point it out, is that there's really not an adult strategy here. The routine EPI uh, immunization schedule really is focused on uh, children under five. In fact, um, the, I think 80 some percent of vaccines are given in the first two years of life. The adult programs uh, exist for maternal immunization, um, tetanus, toxoid during pregnancy. Um, there are uh, certain recommendations of uh, pertussis or influenza in, uh, in pregnancy in settings where the epidemiology is known to be high. Uh, there are certain recommendations for healthcare worker immunization, but um, we do not in most of the world have platforms or strategies to deliver vaccines to adults. WHO uh, provides uh, advice and recommendations through the uh, publication of position papers and uh, the uh, references to adults in the position papers are uh, very uh, rare. Uh, the uh, most uh, recent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine position paper doesn't mention adults at all. This is as of 2019. The last time they uh, mentioned adults was um, uh, in the 2000 teens, and in which uh, they were, they said that um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines are currently not licensed for adults. Of course, um, um, they are now, and there is a there is a need for uh, WHO to review pneumococcal conjugate vaccination for um, adults. With regards to pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, the uh, WHO position is, uh, is uh, short and sweet. It says, in resource-limited settings where there are many competing health priorities, evidence does not support routine immunization of the elderly and high-risk populations with PPV23. For influenza vaccine, WHO um, um, states that it is the uh, individual national decisions on the use of influenza vaccines which will be determined by national capacity and resources. Uh, risk groups to be considered include um, children under five years of age, pregnant women, um, the elderly, individuals with specific chronic medical conditions, and healthcare workers. Um, among those, pregnant women are seen as a priority because they have established uh, immunization platforms. A few other vaccines, the herpes zoster vaccine uh, position states that due to the unknown burden of herpes zoster in most countries and insufficient data, WHO does not offer any recommendation concerning the routine use of herpes zoster vaccine at this time. For maternal immunization, I mentioned tetanus earlier. Uh, it is recommended for pertussis, influenza, and tetanus, but again, in, in very certain epidemiologic circumstances, uh, resources and priorities um, um, permitting. And of course, there are other vaccines that are given to adults, uh, polio or yellow fever during uh, outbreak situations and some uh, vaccinations recommended for adults as part of catch up. But uh, really the uh, WHO focus has been on early childhood immunization and perhaps it is time for a change. Uh, recently, some colleagues and I, we reviewed uh, WHO and UNICEF data to determine the status of adult immunization globally. And in this slide, we uh, identified uh, countries with uh, adult immunization programs categorized by World Bank income status. So black being low income, uh, blue being lower middle income, 
gray upper middle income and the purple being high income. And it should be uh, no surprise to any of you that uh, countries that are uh, high income uh, typically uh, are uh, more likely to have adult immunization programs. The countries that are low income, uh, the only routine immunization programs they have for adults are influenza and those are um, really rather rare. So there, there's a striking disparity among haves and have nots with regards to uh, immunization uh, and um, uh, adult uh, platforms to deliver vaccines. Also as part of this analysis, we determined that um, 38% of countries uh, lack any adult immunization program. This has some serious implications for the COVID-19 vaccine response. We investigated what, what are some predictors of having adult immunization programs. Uh, you know, countries that have introduced new or underutilized vaccines, such as hepatitis B or birth dose or human papillomavirus or rotavirus vaccine, uh, have uh, typically also had adult immunization programs. Uh, countries that have uh, functioning national immunization technical advisory groups, uh, expert uh, uh, advisory committees to assist in the development of policies, uh, they have more likely, uh, they're more likely to have adult immunization programs. And then other countries that have uh, markers of, of strong immunization in general, having eliminated maternal neonatal tetanus or having uh, their third dose of diphtheria pertussis uh, or tetanus pertussis vaccine uh, coverage being above uh, global goals. You know, my interpretation here is that uh, countries that have weak immunization systems will not have adult programs. Um, and then if you think about it, then um, 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 mustering up COVID-19 vaccination in countries with weak uh, immunization programs will encounter uh, challenges. In 2003, the World Health Assembly unanimously passed uh, a resolution, which is um, uh, yet another mandate for uh, life course immunization. This particular resolution was focused on influenza. Um, the, it is called the Prevention and Control of Influenza Pandemics and Annual Epidemics. At the time uh, of this resolution, there was concern about global influenza vaccine manufacturing capacity and the ability to respond to an influenza pandemic. This resolution mandates that all members with influenza vaccine programs immunize uh, more than 75% of elderly and persons with chronic disease annually by 2012 with influenza vaccine. Well, as of 2014, when I did the analysis, uh, two countries had reported uh, achieving this goal among elderly uh, persons, and five countries reported achieving this goal among uh, persons with chronic disease. And so a very poor, very poor uh, 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 response to this mandate, unfortunately. Also, as of 2014, these are the countries uh, in blue that had any influenza vaccine program. You'll see that there's a big uh, glaring gaps in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. Among countries that had uh, national influenza vaccine policies, um, uh, about half focused on children uh, most um, focused on um, adults with chronic illness or pregnant women or healthcare workers or um, um, older persons. Now, just because you have a policy doesn't necessarily mean that you use the vaccine. Uh, in 2015, the International Federation of um, uh, Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, IFPMA, uh, published a survey of seasonal influenza vaccine doses distributed by WHO region, and they showed this over time. Um, and the blue bars here represent influenza vaccines that are distributed to the Americas. 
uh, red bars uh, to the European region, uh, green to the Western Pacific. And so those three regions account for over 95% of vaccines that are distributed by IFPMA members. Uh, striking concern is the, uh, the uh, decline that we see in uh, the European region ever since 2009. Uh, and an even uh, greater concern is how little influenza vaccine utilization we're seeing in the Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asian, and African regions. Now, there are uh, many, many reasons why countries uh, do not use influenza vaccines. Uh, and uh, some of them have to do with cost. Some of them have to do with the fact that the flu vaccine needs to be uh, revised uh, every year with the annual reformulation. Uh, but um, a big challenge with influenza is that the groups that can benefit the most, this would be older adults and adults with chronic diseases, typically do not have platforms for uh, immunization uh, services, as I mentioned earlier. In, in a uh, simulation that I did with some colleagues of a uh, WHO African region country and a WHO Southeast Asian region country, we uh, assumed a 20 million population country with uh, a typical EPI schedule for those regions. And we uh, added up how many doses would be uh, delivered for routine immunization, and then how many doses would be delivered to of influenza vaccines to um, to uh, groups that are identified as high risk by WHO. And so that's uh, children under five, pregnant women, a person 65 years and older, persons with chronic disease. Uh, here's the combined 65 or chronic disease um, to align with that World Health Assembly resolution and healthcare work. What we found, and, and this is no surprise to anyone, that um, if we assume that healthcare workers have access to immunization services, if we assume that pregnant women do through antenatal care, and that uh, children under five can access uh, routine pediatric uh, services, uh, there, it is pretty striking that, old, that adults uh, with chronic disease or older adults uh, you know, just do not have an established platform and it is possible that uh, that, that lack of systems is uh, partly contributing to the lack of uh, compliance with the World Health Assembly resolution. Uh, there are some interesting comparisons between the Southeast Asian country and the African country, just given population demographics. Uh, the uh, uh, typical African country has much larger uh, uh, under five population than does the Asian country, but the Asian country has a much larger uh, elderly population. And this is important in adult immunization, will be very important with COVID-19 vaccination, the large numbers of uh, older adults living in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and other Asian countries will need to be vaccinated. WHO is developing um, a global framework to ensure equitable and fair allocation of COVID-19 products. This uh, framework, to my understanding, will be applied uh, to uh, those countries that are participating in the COVAX facility. So this is not um, all countries, but um, hopefully all low and middle income countries and then the um, um, supporting um, high income countries also participating. Uh, the, this process has identified healthcare system workers as the highest priority. Uh, one reason is that we need to maintain a healthy workforce. Uh, another reason is that they have an established uh, uh, immunization system and uh, they do not require many doses. So uh, the early uh, scarce resource may be best, uh, uh, if, uh, best spent if uh, given to this group. Uh, this will be followed by adults 65 years and older. That's uh, another 8% of the population. And then finally, uh, other high-risk adults with comorbidities adding another 15% to the population. 
in an effort to point out the uh, limitation in personnel and manpower, I went to uh, the uh, WHO workforce website and I found estimates of nurse density per 10,000 population, uh, assuming that uh, um, nurses provide immunization services. Of course, um, uh, I'm here to advocate for pharmacists and, and other healthcare personnel to deliver vaccines as well, but let's just start with this. Uh, this is the nurse density per 10,000 population of each of the WHO regions and you see the African region is seven per 10,000. Western Pacific is another five times that. European region, of course, is, is about 10 times that. All right, so then in this uh, table, the, the data I just showed you comes from here. For the rest of the table, I just did some math. Um, I, I assumed that nurses are vaccinators so I figured out what the, the number of nurses per region is by multiplying the density by the population. And then I found an OECD report that said 43% of nurses in OECD countries provide immunization services. So I, I applied that across the world. So that there, that's broad strokes and, and likely inaccurate for many parts of the world. But that gave me an estimate for nurse vac vaccinators per WHO region. We know the COVID-19 target population is 24% of total by adding up those percentages from the, the WHO slide. And we're assuming that uh, COVID-19 vaccines will require two doses. That, that seems to be the case with the leading candidates right now. Lastly, if we assume that a vaccination campaign would be four months. That leads us to the number of doses that need to be delivered per month uh, to reach the target populations in each of these WHO regions. And I simply divided that number by the number of uh, nurse vaccinators. This gives us a rough sense about the workload of a vaccinator in, the, um, uh, in each of these regions. And so, to address the needs in Sub-Saharan Africa of a COVID-19 uh, mass vaccination campaign, campaign, one nurse vaccinator would need to provide 404 doses per month. Compare this to Europe where the number is uh, 10 times less, you know, or to the Western Pacific where the number is, 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 is five times less. This is a tremendous amount of work because let us not forget that uh, while all of this is happening, we need to maintain our routine immunization services. Um, so this is uh, another a simulated African region country of 20 million people. It has the uh, appropriate age distribution and also has the appropriate uh, uh, vaccine schedule for uh, routine vaccines and, and here we see the routine vaccine doses given uh, monthly should remain about the same and it is represented in the purple lines here. If we were to add uh, uh, two doses of uh, COVID-19 vaccine in a campaign, we would get uh, this many additional uh, doses. If we were to add uh, COVID-19 vaccines for people with chronic disease, it would be this um, turquoise green. And then for healthcare workers, you, you can hardly see it. It's just kind of the black line at the very top. But the, um, the, the, the slide here is uh, added to show that we are um, perhaps doubling our immunization efforts as we uh, muster up to deliver uh, COVID-19 vaccine. It, it, it is highly critical, the routine immunization services continue. You can see that one way uh, countries may cut corners is by limiting uh, routine immunization. And that could be a disaster in areas where, as Michael mentioned, um, polio was um, you know, recently um, declared, um, uh, regions where polio was declared, um, uh, where regions were declared polio free, or where there's a high risk of uh, 
measles outbreaks, uh, etc. cetera. Um, this also speaks to the need for um, expanding uh, immunization services and finding clever ways to um, engage other healthcare personnel who are perfectly capable of delivering vaccines to help with the, um, with the effort. And so this leads us to uh, the Immunization Agenda 2030. This has not been adopted yet to my, to my knowledge. This is a global strategy to leave no one behind. And it's, it's seen as the uh, follow-up to the decade of vaccines that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, within this uh, immunization agenda is uh, strategic priority goal number four, all people benefit from recommended immunizations through the life course, effectively integrated with other essential health services. The uh, objectives here would be to strengthen immunization policies and service delivery through the life course, including for appropriate catch-up vaccinations and booster dose, and establish integrated delivery points of contact between immunization and other public health interventions for different target age groups. I uh, submit that uh, uh, the uh, working with pharmacists is essential to achieve these goals given the workload and the limitations in immunization systems that I described earlier. In summary, global public health funders and policymakers focus vaccine strategies primarily on children under two. Despite mandates to provide vaccines to adults, very little has been done. Influenza vaccines, because of their need for annual administration, uh, they require substantial resources compared to other vaccines. COVID-19 vaccines will also require massive mobilization of resources. Um, and the new 2030 immunization goals have emphasized the need for strengthening life, life course vaccination programs, which provides uh, a great opportunity for, for uh, advocates uh, such as us who want uh, to see uh, pharmacists and others uh, uh, more engaged in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Uh, again, it demonstrates the, the challenges that we face from a societal perspective in meeting the needs of uh, our populations and how, how significant, in a way, I, I was struck by the consequence of the, um, the, the, the need if, we, when we get, if, if and when we get a COVID-19 vaccine and uh, the consequence that will have across the globe in terms of the expectation to be able to meet the demand for vaccination programs. Um, thank you so much to both of you. It's been really fascinating listening to you and, I, and, I, and I've seen a few questions pop up. So please um, ask more um, because it'll help us to obviously to, to address some of the questions and some of the things that you may have thought about during the presentation. And in some ways, one of the things is remember that any question is valuable because I'm sure if you're thinking of it, so is somebody else. So if I can start, I've got a couple of questions at the beginning that I just thought um, would be really interesting to think about. And it sort of fit with a bit of what Justin just said, but also with some of the th uh, things that Michael was saying earlier. So um, Luna in, Leb in the Lebanon has asked that um, one question, which is the major problem is that m most of national programs are f uh, focusing on childhood. And you, you specifically talked about this, Justin. Um, but elderly vaccines are not in the focus. So what can be done to push those? You, we talk about it, but actually what, what else can we do to encourage both the, the governments to think about it, but also almost to create the demand within the population to, to see the value and benefit of these vaccines? Um, Justin or Michael, uh, which of you would like to go first? Mike, Michael, let me come to you first. Give Justin a few seconds to rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, very much, Ash, and thank you, Luna, for that uh, question. The issue of uh, influencing governments has actually been uh, my own uh, particular area of interest and uh, with the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and there you can find uh, some uh, links to how we carry out advocacy. But it also starts, of course, with a government that is... Uh, and managing well and, in, and starts with good governance. So, uh, and I know there are great challenges in Lebanon at the moment, uh, not the least has been the, uh, the fire in, uh, and explosion in Beirut that has taken a huge focus. But when we try to influence government, I think the most important part of it uh, is twofold. Um, one is building good relationships with those who have influence. And you can, and those who influence may well be your politicians, 
may well be your bureaucrats, may well be your journalists. And so the, uh, and never is the answer or, uh, or probably hardly ever is the answer, just uh, focusing on um, one individual. And the other element as uh, a close friend of mine, Professor Rob Moody says, is there are three Ps to your advocacy. It's persistence, persistence and persistence. Uh, and I, I think that it's something that is really important for us because we have to actually make sure that first of all, we have the evidence and that gives you the base upon which to persuade people. And so is that persuasion that carries through. And I've got one final small comment. So I have a background in public health, yes, and, uh, and so on, but also a background in politics. And many of the listeners and those engaged today are pharmacists. Now, let me ask you, who is trusted more, a politician or a pharmacist? Uh, and having asked that question with a very obvious answer, uh, I think that it uh, shows that uh, you will have uh, a significant influence if indeed you're prepared to do it. Uh, and you, of course, you operate through your local societies and your international societies. Um, uh, Ash, I think that's really uh, the best I can do to answer that, uh, that particular question. Thank you. Justin, is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, you think you're still on mute? Well, I agree with what Michael said. I, what I want to add is more of a cautionary tale. I described that World Health Assembly resolution from 2003, which was an absolute disaster, right? I, I'm sure it was seen by many advocates of adult immunization as um, a, uh, a, a, real, um, a, a real success, you know, that they got every country uh, on earth to agree to achieve certain high adult immunization coverage goals by 2012 and then nobody nobody pursued it the um <clears throat> uh, from from what i can tell you know that was a very top-down approach to uh advocacy and, and 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 public health decision making uh that did not take into account the challenges the many many challenges of implementation um, and so uh, I would advocate something that is, as Michael said, more, more evidence-based and it has to be more um, stepwise. And, and there are pathways that are being followed right now. Uh, you know, for the first time, uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, was it last year, two years ago, indicated a willingness to invest in influenza vaccines. It will be a small investment, and I think the focus is not going to be pregnant women. It will probably be healthcare workers. But many, many countries that do not use influenza vaccines, have not regulated them, do not procure them or distribute them, need to have a foot in the door. And uh, I think that um, healthcare workers is a, a reasonable step forward. It was found in 2009 as you know, part of a, a surveys after the 2009 pandemic that the countries that were most successful in deploying and delivering the pandemic influenza vaccines were those countries that had existing influenza policies. And so if there are regular procedures, if there are distribution procedures that um, uh, are uh, used to uh, distributing influenza vaccines, then the, uh, uh, it is easier to respond to a pandemic. And I would argue that it would be easier to add uh, risk groups or expand programs from there. Uh, but uh, the, um, I do not think that a WHO position you know, suddenly advocating for adult immunization will do a whole lot. Uh, what will have to be done, I think, is a very stepwise approach uh, getting countries uh, used to adult immunization and uh, in building a culture around uh, a healthy adult uh, clinic visit for your for your jabs. Thank you, Justin. Um, before I uh, go to some of the other questions I've got, I, uh, and while you have time to think about more questions that you'd like to add, um, I'd like to just. Uh, I introduced two videos that we've that have been put together by FIP to help and uh, to give you some idea of some of the things that we see as being important in vaccination programs.
Thank you. I hope that gives you some insight into some of the things uh, and some of the importance of vaccination programs that we see. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions that have come up and um, I, I, again, I'm not sure who would like to answer, but one of the questions that has come up is the, uh, around um, flu vaccines and the fact that over the last couple of years, there've been some challenges about the efficacy of those vaccines and therefore whether actually we are using the best evidence in making decisions um, about vaccination programs. So I wonder if either of you have anything to say about the, the, how we make sure that where there seems to be challenges around vaccines in the way that I talked about at the very beginning about um, the evidence base uh, and about the value that vaccines bring that uh, combat that position. Either James, James, James uh, Justin, shall I come to you first this time? Oh, sure. I, the, um, I, I think that the evidence around the effectiveness of the influenza vaccine is not new. I think that we've, we've known that it's a moderately effective vaccine uh, for a long time. Uh, there are years, particularly the 2009 pandemic, when we had an excellent match to the circulating strain and we had very... Um, um, high efficacy. The, the issue with flu is that it kills so many people. Um, it is, you know, in the United States, you can estimate that there's around 100 children die from flu a year, but, but 30,000 uh, adults, most of them older adults. And so even with a moderately effective vaccine, when you apply that to a massive uh, 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 burden of disease, you're going to make a very important uh, benefit in your vaccination. Now, it, it's hard when you're sitting across from a patient, you know, you, 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 you appreciate that this vaccine will only be, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent effective. But when you are uh, working in public health, you realize that, you know what, we have populations receiving vaccine that will be 40, 50, 60% effective. And when you apply that uh, uh, effectiveness to these large numbers, you make a major, major impact. The, so that is the, the direct effects of vaccines on older adults. Uh, the, you know, it is uh, shown time and again that vaccinating young children, A, prevent them from having illness uh, which is important, but they also prevent uh, school absenteeism and they prevent them uh, transmitting virus to their grandparents and others who are um, uh, at increased risk. So the, uh, the public health recommendations differ from country to country. I happen to be in a country where um, um, it's recommended that everybody receive the influenza vaccine. Uh, and it is justifiable according to our metrics and our standards. Uh, I think that uh, you know, there are other countries that just uh, uh, recommend immunization of older adults or just recommend immunization in young children. And uh, they are all justifiable according to you know, the country's, the country's uh, vaccination objectives. We are learning a great deal from the UK with their experience uh, with uh, uh, vaccinating young children with live attenuated flu vaccines and then older adults with the, um, with the newer you know, high dose or adjuvanted flu vaccines. They're seeing really uh, measurable and important uh, results in their, in, their, um, in their analyses. And I think that those results will soon be applicable to other settings. Michael, um, one, of, one of the things that strikes me about that, and, and just thinking about what Justin just said as well, is that uh, within that also, is there any data which shows from a public health perspective, the difference between countries where vaccination had taken place and where vaccination hadn't, to be able to, again, demonstrate the difference and actually the benefit that you do get from where you do vaccinate, even when, when you don't have a complete match? Um, and... Uh, I uh, an interesting question. I do not have the data in front of me. I do know that it exists, but uh, and that uh, we do see the advantage. But so, when you're looking at a population, when you're a health minister and you're making a decision to invest in something like this, you're also taking into account um, the impact on the medical profession, on the hospitals, uh, and so and so on. So when you get 
a major flu uh, influenza outbreak, you know the impact that's going to have on your hospitals, you know the costs associated with that. And so the economics, we haven't really talked that much about the economics of, uh, of vaccination, uh, but even when you have a relatively low efficacy vaccine, if you can cut 40% of your influenza cases uh, away from your hospitals, uh, that in itself is a very, very worthwhile exercise. And that's, if you like, almost worst case scenario for, uh, for the vaccines. Um, and I think it's also a case that um, industry is often making a very similar decision, uh, encouraging uh, your workers to uh, have the uh, influenza vaccine, knowing that you're much better to uh, reduce absenteeism. And, you know, and we're not talking about just a small cold, we're talking about serious influenza that is going to leave people out of, uh, away from the workplace uh, at the very minimum for a week. Uh, so uh, quite logically, they, and in terms of productivity uh, even, uh, there is still a very good reason, uh, along with all those reasons that Justin gave, as to why we, uh, why we support the uh, flu vaccines. That leads me into another question I saw, which I think you've, you've part, you, I saw you answer earlier, but, it, but one of the things I saw again from Luna was that the HPV vaccine is very expensive in, in, in Lebanon. And if you have that, that difference in differential in costs, how do you get equity? But it's really interesting about how does the health economics play into that? <laughs> yeah, and uh, of course, uh, I'm uh, almost reluctant to say it with uh, so many males here, but of course, uh, when we're talking about HPV, uh, the prevention of uh, um, uh, cervical cancer is, uh, is really very focused on women. It's a women's uh, vaccine, and, uh, um, uh, and even when men are taking it, it's actually largely protection uh, for uh, for women and in fact in my own country in Australia we are looking forward uh, to a time when women won't even need to have uh, pap smears uh, and uh, and I imagine most of the women in your audience are nodding and uh, be feeling very pleased about uh, that for their children or their grandchildren perhaps um, but this is in marked contrast uh, to the Pacific where where HPV uh, vaccine has not been widely used. And, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, one of our uh, goals this year for Rotary in Australia, we've got uh, Rotary in Australia for 100 years, and our fundraising is largely focused on HPV in the Pacific. So when we take it back to Lebanon, how do we get the vaccine uh, distributed there? Well, first and foremost, uh, it is a government responsibility. Uh, and so attempting to influence government is really important. Um, uh, but secondly, I think the, uh, um, also there are many non-government organisations and we've talked about uh, the international ones, Gavi and, uh, and my own World Federation of Public Health Associations and uh, the World Health Organisation, UNICEF. These are all organisations that uh, are concerned about uh, these issues in countries and uh, tapping into those resources, I think, is incredibly important. Um, there is no easy solution. Yeah. Uh, it takes hard work. It takes persistence. Thank you, Michael. Um, Justin, I've got another question for you here. You talked very much, you, because it was interesting in your data, you talked about the, how much the consequence will be when we have a COVID, if and when we have a COVID-19 vaccine on, um, on volumes. So I just wondered, uh, one of the questions has come up, what do you expect the pharmacist's role to play in COVID-19 mass vaccinations when a vaccine does become available? How critical is their role going to be? I, I think the system um, is different depending on um, country and circumstances. My particular focus ever since I was at WHO was in the uh, poorest countries. Uh, but let me um, change and discuss uh, what the plans are in, in my country in the United States, where pharmacists have a real critical role in uh, immunization uh, and um, vaccine delivery. The, uh, in fact, just yesterday, I, I called three different pharmacies to see if they had uh, the uh, uh, live attenuated flu vaccine for my son, who would, who would much prefer to go to the pharmacist and get the flu mist squirt in his nose than, than a jab. Uh, the the uh, pharmacist will be critical because uh, 
we need to distribute the work and we need to make uh, vaccination as easy as possible. And sometimes that means uh, going to the, uh, the pharmacy around the corner. Sometimes that means going to the pharmacy in the, the store when you're doing you know, your other, your other um, errands. Uh, the, um, uh, there will not be enough uh, human resources to, you know, for just immunization clinics to deliver vaccines. We will have to develop new systems if we indeed want to vaccinate uh, all high-risk individuals. Uh, and, and this will absolutely involve pharmacists. I, I can imagine that countries, uh, perhaps uh, you know, UK or Australia, that have a little bit better um, uh, uh, organized and integrated uh, immunization services would do even more. But in the United States, the the role of pharmacists with vaccine delivery has been um, strong uh, for many years, and it's getting stronger uh, with uh, issues like those that I mentioned before about uh, making sure that your children have are up to date with their routine vaccines, as well as um, uh, you know people who just have a lunch hour and make a quick trip to the pharmacy rather than make an appointment with their with their GP. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I agree. You're right. And I, I know some of the work I've done um, here in the UK, we've seen, we've very much seen that. And uh, the, the role of the pharmacist is seen as quite critical. And almost some of the, some of the things that we're doing this winter in terms of flu vaccines um, and the expectation from both um, uh, uh, primary care physicians and from community pharmacy is very much almost like a, uh, a test run for when, a, when and if we do have that COVID vaccine to be able to get the maximum out. Michael, did you want to uh, say anything around that or? Yeah, yeah, I did want to, and there's also a question from somebody in Nigeria. So how do you yes. get the, uh, how do you do this transition to pharmacy when uh, the medical profession, when the doctors are objecting? And uh, we've been through this transition relatively recently uh, in Australia. And I think you start with a vaccine uh, that um, is that you, that's understood and needs to be distributed, such as measles. Um, and the reason you do that is because that's actually protecting our children. And so then when doctors are being reluctant, then you're saying, well, but our pharmacists can also help protect our children. So, it, but it's, it's a, a process of getting uh, your community on side, then the politicians almost invariably come on later um, and then, uh, and so that's the process and you do it, of course, uh, through your pharmacy organisations, but also it's really important at the individual level because uh, the community, almost all the community comes into the pharmacists at some stage uh, and there's, a, there's an incredible power uh, there and, and indeed the uh, politicians uh, regularly come into your pharmacy as, uh, as well. So if you're fortunate enough there, then have a little chat to them. Thank you, Michael. Um, I've got a, a broader question. It sort of goes a bit to the bit of that towards the how do we see the role of pharmacists in the mass vaccination programs we see around COVID. Um, I know that uh, Catherine FIP have been doing a lot of work in this area, and one of the plans is. About, and I know I saw a question earlier about what does what's the policy position that uh, that Kath, that um, FIP are going to put forward to support um, this this rollout and this expectation around vaccination. And I think it isn't just around COVID. I think it's much much more general. But actually in a way, a bit like Michael just said, does COVID become our trigger for some of these things? Yeah, I, I think it does, Ash. And what I'd urge all the colleagues on the uh, session today and those who are listening in to go back to the previous events, because what you'll find there is a lot of practical advice about how to support you as a practitioner and your team where appropriate, almost like support for you. Then there's advocacy toolkits and ways in which you can um, demonstrate the impact of pharmacists and pharmacy being a good place to access vaccines to those in power and even to other professions. Um, another point would be to get countries that have done this successfully to come in and support countries that are struggling. I see some comments up from Nigeria in the question box about doctors having a problem with um, pharmacists prescribing uh, or vaccinating, sorry. And this happens in other countries. We've got great examples of how um, pharmacists in Ireland have dealt with this. We're also, we also did a call to action 
um, this week in one of our other events about using the community pharmacy workforce in particular as a resource for vaccination. And this will be launched on World Pharmacist Day, so we'd love you all to get involved and lobbied. And finally, Ash, it's not just about COVID. Mm -hmm. um, COVID as a political agenda right now means that what Justin and Michael just said, all of the patients and the public who are accessing their pharmacies as the only open door health professional available to every single person globally, pharmacy is the only profession that has had an open door throughout COVID, means that patients are much more likely to think of a pharmacy first now. That's a moment in time that we can capture. But if you only think about COVID, then we're only going to be addressing this acute issue and I think Justin's figures were very very sobering about the capacity that we will get to vaccinate. Let's get a vaccination program linked to equity agendas for those who are of different ages. Vaccinating everyone for everything possible would give us a healthier population and pharmacies here. So apologies colleagues for taking up some airspace on this, but I urge those of you who would like some support to go back through the, uh, the series that uh, I mentioned at the start and to join us next Friday on World Pharmacist Day to sign up to the call to action. And then we will be doing some regional engagement, national engagement about how we commit to this. Um, there's so much to do and frankly, no health professional has got the mandate over the territory of vaccination. We all need to roll our sleeves up now, Ash, and we all need to play our part in that. And that includes being vaccinated ourselves, as you rightly said. Enough That's from me, but uh, anytime you need me to prompt in, lovely. Thank you. I just I, I thought, just picking up on something also that Michael just said about um, they, they did it through measles. I think that the thing for any country, particularly when you have this challenge with, your, with, the, with the doctors, is to find the ones that are, are struggle from a, from a delivery perspective, whatever it is, whether it's measles, whether it's flu, whether it's going to be COVID, whether it's going to be something else, that demonstrates how much value pharmacy is able to bring to the table and therefore how much of a change it makes in the delivery of the, the health pop, the population, of the, health, the health of the entire population. Because the more we do that, the more people and governments particularly and populations see the value that pharmacy is bringing and then it encourages them to see that as being part of the trigger to do it for other vaccines as well. Because yeah. I think it's very much a situation. And look again, look, you know, looking at that data uh, that Justin had about countries where there's very little vaccination currently the the opportunity and the, the gaps that are there are enormous and actually you know for, for countries like Australia the UK um, US we're very lucky in some ways that our population are so well vaccinated to some extent that we can all do better we can always always do much better but at the same time, if you compare that to countries where there's very low vaccination rates and the opportunity that presents and how FIP can help to be able to get that message across, I think is critical. And I think we have a real responsibility from, a, from an organizational perspective as FIP and as individuals to make that change and to make sure that we do get to a situation where we get maximum va vaccination programs and that we encourage the use of all professionals, whoever you are, in whatever circumstance to support what the patient and the public want to be able to deliver their vaccinations. And my fa we're just about to run out of time. So I'm going to ask uh, each of you in turn, um, your final one take home message that you'd like to give to all of the people that have, part that have um, joined us, the attendees of this, uh, this session. Um, Michael, since your picture's up first, I'm gonna ask you first, your one take home message for everybody that you want them to leave today with. Um, I did start by talking about how we value uh, things uh, in a societal sense and, uh, and what are our values. Uh, but there is another element to that that I'd like people to think about, uh, and that is the economics. Um, you know, in the end, having uh, the medical profession delivering vaccines, great. It's much cheaper when you're doing it through pharmacies for governments, and it's much cheaper for individuals. So make really sensible decisions based on the evidence in front of you and don't forget the economics. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Justin, you're on mute still. There's a theory of uh, evolution that, you know, evolution doesn't actually happen very slowly over time. But in fact, evolution happens uh, with these kind of punctuated, massive uh, uh, changes 
uh, uh, the theory is called punctuated equilibrium, I believe. And, 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 and I think that that's true, that there are, there are times when change happens suddenly and, and change happens um, uh, uh, great. And I would argue that this is a time, uh, particularly when it comes to the uh, integration of uh, pharmacists and pharmacy services in immunization. There is such a need, uh, not just for COVID, but to build uh, adult immunization services. I, I, I see no reason why uh, pharmacies in low resource settings can't become the new EPI clinics for adults. Um, there is uh, you know, clear uh, workforce limitations. There's um, a clear need uh, to ensure uh, cold chain uh, uh, availability, things that um, are at uh, pharmacies and that can be utilized to, to advance this new 2030 immunization agenda. And so I, I, I strongly recommend that uh, FIP and that uh, you know, your individual leaders uh, continue to engage with WHO, continue to engage with uh, uh, country ministries of health because there, there's an opportunity here that is coming out of uh, need. And, um, and uh, I think that as was said by Catherine earlier that uh, COVID is an excuse, but there, there's this opportunity for sudden drastic needed change. Thank you both. And thank you uh, to all of you. And can I particularly thank our attendees and can I thank you for all the questions that you've uh, raised. I'm sorry we've not been able to answer them all. I'm sure that we'll try, they've all been captured and uh, we will get answers to you and we'll make sure they're available. And as I said at the beginning, don't forget that you can access uh, the recordings uh, subsequently. Um, so I, I'm so grateful to both Michael and Justin for having made this such a fascinating session and to see the the, the how much of it, how much uh, value we get from this and Catherine um, thank you for uh, reminding us all of the program that you that uh, FIP are developing and the, the opportunity there is to utilize that as on a, on a global basis to really make a difference to our to not just our own populations but to the the population we call the globe Thank you all so much for participating and thank you so much for, um, for joining and listening to this. Take care. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Ash. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.